So today we have a lot of stuff to get through, but it's all going to be fairly formal. We're not, we're not, we're not going to have time to play a game today. Today's going to be a day when we have to learn some new ideas. So the reason we need to go through some new formal ideas today is we've kind of exhausted what we can do with the ideas we've gathered so far. So just to bring us up to date where we are, in the first half of the semester, so before the midterm, we looked at simultaneous move games. And one way to think about those simultaneous move games were games where when I, take my, when I, when I make my choice, I don't know what you've done. And when you make your choice, you don't know what I've done. All right? And since the midterm, we've been looking at, at simple examples of sequential move games, sequential move games under perfect information, in which I typically do know what you did when, when I get to make my choice. All right? And you know I'm going to know what you did when I get to make my choice. And what I want to be able to do uh, moving forward is I want to be able to look at, at strategic situations that combine those two settings. I want to be able to analyze games which involve both sequential moves and simultaneous move games. All right? and, and in particular, I want to see how we can extend our, the technique we've been focusing on for the last few weeks, which is backward induction. I want us to see how we can extend the notion of backward induction to cope with games where some parts are sequential and some parts are simultaneous. All right? So we're going to look at a lot of examples, and we're going to introduce some new ideas, and I'm going to try and walk you through that today. So that's our goal. Let's start with an example. So here's a very simple game in which player one moves first and has three choices. Let's call them up, middle, and down. And then player two moves, and player two has two choices from each of these nodes. And we'll call the choices suggestively up and down, up and down. And here we'll just call them left and right. All right and the payoff are as follows. 4, 0, 0, 4, 0, 4, 4, 0, 1, 2, 0, 0. So this is just a standard game of perfect information, much like all the games we've seen since the midterm. In fact, it's a relatively easy one. So we know how to solve this game. We solve this game using what? Using backward induction. And that isn't so hard here. We know that player two, uh, if player two finds herself up here, she will choose four rather than zero. If she finds herself here, she'll choose four rather than zero. And if she finds herself here, she'll choose two rather than one. So player one won't want to go up here because uh, he'll get zero. And he won't want to go into the middle because he'll get zero. And he won't want to get, uh, and if he, but if he goes down, uh, player one will choose left and, and play, uh, player one will get one. So player one will choose down. So backward induction predicts that player one chooses down and player two responds by choosing left. And just staring at this a second, notice that the reason in this game, it's taking a step back from back induction a second, the reason player one did not want to choose either up or middle was because that move was going to be observed by player two, and in either case, player two was going to crush player one. Right? So if player one went up, player two was playing this sort of strictly competitive game with player, player one, and player, player two could design, could make a choice that got, gave two four and one zero. And conversely, if player uh, one chose middle, player two could crush player, player one by choosing up, which gave, once again, player two four and player one zero. So there was a good reason here to avoid going into the part of the game following up or middle, and the reason was two, was, was, two has a huge second mover advantage in those parts of the game. That clear to everybody? So I now want to consider a similar but importantly different game. So I'm going to draw the game again. Well, before I draw it, let me see what I'm going to do. So I want to, I, I want to introduce a new idea, and the new idea is going to be that player two, <coughs> that player two will not be able to distinguish between up or middle. So as I said again, so if, if player one chooses down, player two will observe that, just as we've done before in, the, under, in our standard perfect information games. But if player one chooses either up or middle, I want to capture the idea that player two doesn't know which of those two choices was made. Right? That's clearly going to change the game a lot. And the first question is, how do we represent that idea in a tree? So let me try and show a good way to represent that in a tree. So the game has the same structure to it. 
Player one is, again, choosing between up, middle, and or down. And player two, once again, is choosing here, up or down, up or down, and here, left or right. And the payoffs haven't changed. They're still 4, 0, 0, 4, 4, 0, 0, 4, 1, 2, and 0, 0. So that's exactly the same as you have in your notes already. But now I want to, to, to adapt this tree to show how we indicate that player two cannot distinguish, cannot observe whether one chose up or middle, but can observe if player one has chosen down. And the way we do that, very simply, we draw a dotted line between the two nodes of player two, between which two cannot distinguish. So this idea here, what this dotted line indicates, is that these two nodes are set in the same information set. So our new idea here is the idea of an information set. Uh, I did, I did, I did, I did. Thank you. Zero, four, four, zero. Thank you, thank you. All right, payoffs are meant to be the same on the left as on the right. All right, so the idea here is that two, player two, cannot distinguish these two nodes. Player two knows that she's in this information set. She knows that player one must have chosen either up or middle. She knows that player one did not choose down. But she doesn't know whether she's really here or here. OK? Now, what happens in this game? This game is a very different game. Why is it a different game? Well, let's try and apply that loose, inform that in that loose intuition we, applied, we, we talked about before. We said previously in the old game that if player one shows up, two knew that player one had chosen up and observed that by choosing down, player two could crush one. And if player one chose middle, player two could observe that player one had chosen middle and this time by choosing up could crush one. The problem is that now in this new game, player two doesn't know whether he's here, whether she's here, in which case she would want to choose down or here, in which case she'd want to choose up. All right, so player two's choice is not so obvious anymore. That simple backward induction argument has disappeared. Moreover, player one knows that player two will not be able to reserve between up or middle, so it isn't necessarily the case that player one will want to choose down anymore. It's still true that if player one did choose down, that player two would be able to observe that and we'll choose left. So that part of the argument's the same. What do we think is going to happen here? Well, we don't know, but let me give a suggestion what might happen here. Player one might say, hey, I could randomize between up and middle. I could choose half the time up and half the time middle. If I choose half the time up and half the time middle, player two isn't going to know, in general, isn't going to, isn't going to know what I've done. It isn't quite clear what player two is going to do. And if, since I'm randomizing between up or middle, whatever player two is going to do, I'm going to get half the time four and half the time zero for an expected value of two. All right, so said again, so player one might decide in this game to randomize 50-50 between up and middle, knowing that half the time, therefore, he will get two, uh, four, and half the time he'll get zero for an expected value of two, which notice is better, is better than he got by choosing down. All right? So this change in this game, changing the information in this game, not only led to a different game, it led to a very different outcome. All right, so here, here, one might, for example, they might randomize between up and middle. And over here, we know exactly what one does. One chooses down. Run chooses down. So we get very different outcomes because of this change in information in the game. And the theme of today is that information is going to matter. The way we're going to model information is by thinking about these information sets. And as we go through today, I want to start giving you some formal definitions. So this is the idea. Now let's look at the formal definition. There's been a lot of writing today, so I hope, hope uh, 
I hope you brought uh, a, a notepad with some room on it. All right, so the first formal definition of the day comes off that last example. The formal definition is the idea that I want to capture. I want to capture the idea that players down the tree may not know exactly what was done up the tree. And the formal definition is going to, is going to go through the idea of an information set. So an information set of player i, in this case above player 2, but more generally of player i, is a collection, or a set if you like, it's a collection of player i's nodes between which, or I guess it could be more than two, so let's say among which, among which I cannot distinguish. All right. It's going to turn out that by clever use of information sets, we're going to be able to use our technology, our technology of drawing trees, to capture all sorts of interesting and increasingly complicated information settings. All right. In this particular game, it's the case that player one knew that player two was not going to be able to distinguish between up or middle in this tree, and player one knew that player two would be able to distinguish in the left-hand tree. We can even use information sets in a more elaborate tree to capture the idea that player one may not know what player two is going to know. But I won't do that now. I'll leave that later, and you'll see some examples of that on the homework. All right. So we have our formal definition. This is going to be our, the first of our big tools of the day. But let me just put down a few things that we have to be careful about, a couple of rules. So these information sets have to obey certain rules. And certain things are not allowed. Certain things are not allowed. So in particular, the following is not allowed. Here's a tree in which player one moves first, and player two does not observe player one's move. So these two nodes are player two's nodes. Between, they're in the same information set, which means player two is not meant to be able to distinguish between these two nodes. And suppose, however, the tree looked like this. OK, so I claim that this is, this is crazy. We couldn't allow this. It wouldn't make any sense to allow this. Can anyone see why? Why, wouldn't it, why? why is this not really a sensible tree? Anyone see that? Why is that not a sensible tree? Is it, yeah, do you, want, do you want to grab somebody? Yeah, uh, Ali, just the guy behind you. Yeah, that's good. That's great. Shout out. If player two knows that he has three choices, then he'll know he's at the top node. Exactly, exactly. In this tree, you haven't got the payoffs in, but if player two, if player two observes that she has three choices, she knows she must be at the top node. If she observes she has two choices, she must be at the bottom node. Right? So in this, in this tree, it was supposed to be the case that two didn't know whether she was here or here, but merely by observing how many choices she has, she could infer whether she was at the top node or the bottom node. So that can't make any sense. So this is not allowed. So we'll put a great cross through that one. Now, the second thing that's not allowed is a little bit more subtle and actually, it's an interesting thing. And this is just kind of bookkeeping. But the second thing's more interesting. So let's have a look at it. Here's a more interesting tree. Player one moves first. Player two observes that move. All right, and player two moves second. And then at the bottom of this, player one may have another chance to move again. So again, I haven't put payoffs in here. Player one moves first, player two moves second, and if player two chooses down here or up there, then player one gets to move again. Now I claim again that this is not a sensible tree. It's not a sensible uh, arrangement of information sets. Can anyone see why this isn't sensible? Why is this not sensible? Yeah, uh, Stephen, yeah. Shout it out. Player one knows what node he's at based on the first choice that he made. Exactly, exactly. So to get to the upper node here for player one, player one must have chosen up before. And to get to the lower node here, player one must have played down before. So provided that player one remembers his or her own move, she knows where she is. Is that right? right so provided player one can recall what she herself did earlier on the tree, she should be able to distinguish these things. 
So we're going to rule this out, but I just want to make a remark here. There's an assumption in ruling it out, and the assumption is we're assuming perfect recall or perfect memory. We're assuming perfect recall. And people don't always, in the real world, uh, players don't always have perfect recall. There are two reasons, and we're always going to assume this, but let me just make a remark. There are two reasons why people might not have perfect recall. One reason is, like me, they're getting old. Right? They simply can't remember what they did yesterday. All right? So when I'm driving home, I know roughly how many traffic lights I have to go through uh, before I turn right, uh, but I sometimes forget which traffic light I'm at, and I turn right too early or too late. All right? That doesn't happen to you guys, but it happens to me as I'm getting a bit senile. All right? So old age would rule out perfect recall. A more important example, perhaps, is if players of games are themselves institutions. It's sometimes useful, and we've often talked about it in this class, to imagine a player of a game being a firm or a country or some kind of institution in which the actual decisions may be being taken by different, different actual people within the firm, institution, or country. Right? And this assumption of perfect recall is saying that the players within the institution knew what the other players within that same institution were doing. Right? So if, we, if we're modeling uh, General Motors as one player, this assumption is assuming that the chief financial officer and the chief executive officer of GM uh, are observing each other's actions or on the same page. The left hand knows what the right hand's doing. All right? We are typically going to assume that, but just to make the point, it is an assumption. All right? And it's quite interesting to see what happens if you relax it. All right, so with that in mind, we can move to our next definition. And this is something I've referred to early on in the class, but I want to be formal now. Now we can be formal. We've talked earlier on in this class about the idea of perfect information. So, for example, when we talked about Zermelo's theorem, we talked about games of perfect information. And we said informally what this was. A game of perfect information is a game where each player in the game can observe all previous moves. Right, that was our informal definition, but we can now give a formal definition very simply. Perfect information is, is a setting where all information sets, all information sets in the tree, games of perfect information are games where all information sets in the tree contain just one node. All right, I want to be uh, clear here. So what we're saying here is here, if we have a tree in which every information set is a singleton, we basically never bother with any dotted lines, that's a game of perfect information. And that shouldn't be a surprise to anybody here, because that's exactly how we drew trees since the midterm. Is that right? Of course, the novelty is we're now going to be allowed to look at games of imperfect information. Right. The reason we're doing this is because it would be interesting, as in the example we've just seen, to think about games where information is not perfect. So what is the definition of imperfect information? Imperfect information, formal definition is not perfect information. All right, we've defined what perfect information is. Imperfect information is the rest. All right, in the real world, there's a lot of games that turn out to have imperfect information. There's lots of strategic situations where I'm going to be able to observe some things that you've done, but other things I won't know quite what you've done. <laughs> OK, let's go straight to an example. All right, so I, I, I don't think we really need to keep that definition uh, very focal, so let's get rid of that board. All right, let's do an example. There are many examples today. All right, so this example is going to be a tree in which player one moves first. Player two cannot observe this move. And sometimes, rather than labeling both of these nodes with a two, I'll just put a two on the information set, right? So just to indicate that both of these nodes belong to player two. So player two moves second. And we'll call player one's move up or down. And we'll call player two's move left or right. Kind of suggestively, left or right. Okay. 
So what's the information set here? The information set is indicating the fact that player two cannot observe whether player one moved up or down. Player two cannot observe whether player one chose up or down. All right, now, why does that matter? I haven't put the payoffs in yet, but I will in a second. It matters because had this game been a game of perfect information, had this information set, had there been two information sets here, this dotted line not been there, then player two could have chosen separately whether to choose left or right at this node or left or right, and left or right at this node. But since player two doesn't know whether she's at the upper node or the lower node, she doesn't know whether player one chooses up or down, she really only has one choice to make here. She's either choosing left at both nodes or she's choosing right at both nodes. And just to pull it back to our first example in the class, we saw the same feature there. When we move from a game of perfect information to a game of imperfect information, we reduced the choices available for, for player two. Here, player two could choose separately, up or down, at these two different nodes. But here, player two only makes one choice that has to apply to both nodes, because player two cannot distinguish those two nodes. All right. So let's have a look and see, once we put some payoffs on, what it does in this particular game. All right, so here's some payoffs. 2, 2, minus 1, 3, 3, minus 1, and 0, 0. All right, so once again, player 2 cannot separately choose at the upper node or the lower node. She's either choosing left or she's choosing right. But it turns out that this game is a little easier than the game we started with. Why is it easier than the game we started with? It's easier than the game that we started with because from player two's point of view, whether she thinks she's up here or whether she thinks she's down here, she has the same best choice in either case. If she thinks she's at the upper node, then by choosing left, she'll get two, and right, she'll get three. So right seems better. If she thinks she's at the lower node, then choosing left gets minus one, and right gets zero. So once again, right is better. So in fact, in this particular game, regardless of whether player two thinks that player one shows up, and hence she's at the upper node, or whether think player two thinks that player one shows down, and hence she's at the lower node, player two is going to make the same choice in this game, namely right. So notice that this particular game actually solves out rather like backward induction. Rather like backward induction. We actually know, even though, well, even though player two's choice is a little bit more complicated because she doesn't know where she is, it's actually clear what player two will do uh, at this information set. Now, if we push this forward a little bit harder, we can see why. Player one in this game has two strategies, up or down, and player two has two strategies. She either chooses left or right. Notice she only has two strategies because she has to choose the same thing at these two nodes. She doesn't know where she is. All right? Okay. So let's draw up the matrix for this game and see if it looks familiar. All right? So player one is choosing between up or down, and player two is choosing between left or right. And the payoffs are as follows. Up left is 2, 2. Up right is minus 1, 3. Uh, down left is 3, minus 1. And down right is 0, 0. All right? Down right is 0, 0. So what game is this? It wasn't meant to be a trick question. So somebody, uh, somebody wave their arm in the air. What game is this? Shout it out if you like. This is Prisoner's Dilemma, right? This is, a, this is an old friend of ours. This is Prisoner's Dilemma. A game we, we saw the very first day. But notice, what have we seen here? This is Prisoner's Dilemma that we have seen many, many times that's almost uh, unbearably familiar to most of you. Right? And here's Prisoner's Dilemma as represented the way in which we talked about games before the midterm. But here is the same game. This is also Prisoner's Dilemma, but now I've drawn in a tree. Here I drew it in a matrix, and here I drew it in a tree. Now that we have information sets, we can represent all the games that we studied 
before the midterm, all the games that were simultaneous move games, we can study using trees by building information sets. <coughs> and what's the key observation here? It doesn't really matter whether player one moves first or player two moves first. It doesn't really matter what's happening temporally in this game. What matters is information. When player one makes her move, she doesn't know what player two is going to do. Right? And or she doesn't know what two is doing. And when player two makes her move, she doesn't know what one is doing. Right? And that's a simultaneous move game, even if time is passing. The key is information, not uh, not time. All right. Now, on the way here, I snuck something in. And I should just tell you what I snuck in. I snuck in what a strategy is. I went from an ex a, a tree, or an extensive form game, to a normal form game. And we've already done that a couple of times before in the class. We did it with the entry game, for example, uh, uh, about a week ago. All right? But there, all we did was we defined what a strategy was in a game of perfect information. And just to remind you, a strategy in a game of perfect information is a complete plan of action. It tells the player in question what they should do at each of their nodes. All right, but now we have to be a bit more careful. We can't have a strategy. If, if, once, once we move to imperfect information, we can't have a strategy tell you what to do at each of your nodes because you yourself can't distinguish between those nodes. All right, so we need to adapt our notion, our definition of a strategy to make it appropriate for these more complicated games. So let's just adapt it in the obvious way. Definition. Definition. I'll just define pure strategies for now. A pure strategy, a pure strategy of player I is a complete plan of action. So this is the same as before. It's a complete plan of action. It's a complete plan of action. But what does it mean to be a complete plan of action? It can't tell me what to do at every single node. Uh, can't, can't, that, that can't be the right definition because I can't distinguish nodes. So all it can be doing is telling me what to do at each information set. All right? So it specifies. It specifies what player I should do. Should perhaps is the wrong word. Let's just say will do will do at each of I's information sets. All right? So you go back uh, uh, about a week, you'll see almost exactly the same definition of a strategy, but the previous definition told I what to do at each node, and this one just tells I what to do at each information set. All I'm doing is tidying up the previous definition so we can apply it to the more interesting games we're going to look at from now on. All right, so now we have the definition of a strategy. We can, uh, we, we can, we can carry on the idea we've just seen here. So what's the idea here? Any game you give me in the form of a tree, I can rewrite the game in the form of a matrix. All right, so let's see some other examples of that idea. There's a lot of new ideas today, but some of them are just tidying up and kind of bookkeeping, and some of them are more interesting. All right. So let's start with a tree. Let's make it a slightly more interesting tree than the one we've seen before. Actually, that's too interesting. Let's, let's go a, bit, a little bit slower. So let's have player one have two choices, and player two have three choices. All right, so here's a, a simple tree, and let's put some payoffs in. But let me just put some letters in for payoffs rather than put in numbers. All right, so we'll call these actions up and down, and we'll call this action left, middle, and right, and left, middle, and right, and we'll call the payoffs A1, A2, B1, B2, C1, C2, D1, D1, 
D2, E1, E2, and F1, F2. All right, so just to keep track of it. And I want to show you how we take this tree and turn it into a matrix. All right? So how do, we, how do we turn it into a matrix? Well, we look and say, how many strategies has player one got, and how many strategies has player two got? So player one here just has two strategies, up or down, and player th two has three strategies, either left, middle, or right. Again, they can't choose separately at these two nodes, so they really just have three choices, left, middle, or right. Now, leave a space here in your notebook, leave a space to the right here, and let's draw the matrix for this tree down here. All right, so here's my matrix. Player two is choosing left, middle, or right, and player one is choosing up or down. All right, and the payoffs uh, go in, as, uh, in, in the obvious way. So A1, A2, B1, B2, C1, C2, D1, D2, E1, E2, and F1, F2. All right, so everyone understand that was just a simple exercise to show we can go from an extensive form, a tree, to the normal form, the matrix. All right. However, okay, so that was easy, right? However, there's an interesting thing here. It isn't obvious that this is, if, if I just gave you the matrix, it isn't obvious that this is the tree from which it came. Let me draw another tree that I claim corresponds to that same matrix. Right? Here's another tree. So this other tree, instead of having player one move first, it's going to have player two move first. Player two better have three choices, and we better call them left, middle, and right. And it better be the case that player one is in one big information set, and player one only has two choices, which we'll call up and down. Right, that, that's what this matrix is telling us. It's telling us player two had three choices and player uh, one, player two had three choices and player one had two choices. So that's true in the in the in the matrix I've drawn. And let's be a little bit careful where the payoffs are. So left up, that's easy. That's going to be a one, a two. Left down is going to be d one, d two. Middle up is going to be b one. B2, middle down is going to be E1, E2. Uh, uh, right up is going to be C1, C2, and right down is going to be F1, F2. All right, so I have to be a little bit careful where I put the payoffs, but I think that's right, what I just did. And notice that what I did here, I started from this tree. It was an easy operation to construct the matrix, so easy that it was kind of boring. And it's not that hard to see that I can go the other way and construct this other tree from, from the matrix. This is also a tree in which player two has three strategies, and player one, this is all player one, has two strategies. All right, so what? Well, what do we learn from this? All right, well, let's look at this more carefully. This tree is a tree in which player one moved first, and player two didn't observe player one's choice. Is that right? This is a tree in which player two moved first, and player one didn't observe two's choice. Right? What are we noticing here? They're really the same game. There's no difference between these two games. All right? They're really the same game. It doesn't matter whether it's player one moving first and player two who's unable to observe one's choice, or whether it's player two's moving first and player one who is unable to observe uh, two's choice. Right? All that matters is that neither player could observe the other person's choice before they got to move. They both correspond to exactly the same, the same game. All right? So what's the message here? The message is something we've talked about before in the class, but I'm trying to be a bit more formal about it. The message is that what matters what matters is information. What matters is information, not time. Not time. Clearly, time 
you know, clearly time isn't an irrelevant thing. I couldn't know something that hasn't happened yet. All right? So time is going to have an effect on information. But ultimately what matters is information. What do I know and when did I know it? All right? So the key idea that we're trying to capture with these information sets, just to repeat, is what did the player know and when did they know it? All right? That famous expression from the uh, Watergate trials. All right. <coughs> OK, let's look at a more interesting example and see if we can actually talk about what's going to happen in these games. So by the end of today, I want to have enough machinery so we can actually start analyzing these games and predicting what's going to happen. All right. So as we go on, we'll get more complicated. So let's get a little bit more complicated now. Once again, here's a game in which player one is going to have two choices. And we'll call those choices up or down. It's getting a familiar theme. And once again, player two is going to move next. And now this time, just to keep things simple, we'll have player two just have two choices, left or right, or left or right. But now to make things more interesting, let's have player one move again. So if up right happens, then player one gets to move again, in which case player one is going to choose up or down. And I'll use a little u and a little d to distinguish it from the ones uh, further to the left of the tree. All right, so this is a very simple tree. Player one moves first, player two moves second. I forgot to put a two in here. And then if up right has occurred, then player one gets to move again. Let's put some payoffs in. So let's have this be 4, 2, 0, 0, 1, 4, 0, 0 again, and 2, 4. All right. Let's just carry on <coughs> analyzing this game using exactly the methods we've been talking about in the class today so far. So the first thing I'm going to do is I want to turn this into a matrix. I want to turn this into a matrix. And the first thing to do on, the, uh, uh, on that route is to try and figure out how many strategies does player one have and how many strategies does player two have. All right? And before we even do that, let's try and figure out how many information sets they have. All right? So I claim that player two just has the one information set. Is that right? Player two just has the one information set. But player one has two information sets this information set at the beginning of the game, and then potentially the second information set down the, uh, further down the tree. All right? a, strategy must tell you every, must, 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 a strategy must tell the player what to do at each of their information sets. So the strategies for player one, strategies for player one are what? Well, one strategy is up and then up again. Another strategy is up and then right. Another strategy is down and then up. And a fourth strategy is down and then right. And notice something which we've seen already in this class before. There's a little bit of a redundancy here. These two down strategies, these two down strategies uh, uh, force the game into a, uh, force the game into a part of the tree where this node will not arise. But put it less grandly, if player one chooses down, she knows that she won't have to, uh, she won't have to make a choice of up or down later on. Jake? Uh, thank you. Sorry, thank you. Thanks, Jake. So, all right, let me start again since I did the wrong notation. All right, so player one's choices are up and then up, up and then down, down and then up, and down and then down. Thanks, Jake. Sorry. All right? Now, why are the four strategies? It's a bit of a surprise, perhaps, because if player one chooses down, then she knows she will never have to make a choice at her second information set. Nevertheless, nevertheless, we write down every, when we write down a strategy, we have to write down an instruction for every single information set, so we include both of those strategies. Strategies for player two here are a little bit easier. Strategies for player two are just left or right. All right. 
With that in mind, let's draw up the matrix. So player one here has uh, four strategies, and they are up, 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 down, down, up, and down, down. And player two has two strategies, and they are left or right. All right, everyone okay so far? We're just basically uh, transferring things across. And now we have to transfer the payoffs across. So up, up, followed by left is going to be 4, 2. Uh, up, up, followed by right is going to be 0. So up, up, right. It's pretty easy to think it's up, right, up. So up, right, up is 0, 0. Uh, up, left, uh, up, up, down, left is the same as up, left, down. So it's again 4, 2. Up, down, right is going to be up, right, down. So it's going to be 1, 4. Down, up, left is the same as saying down, left. So it's going to be 0, 0. All right. Down, up, right is going to be 2, 4. Down, down, left is once again going to be 0, 0. And down, down, right is once again going to be 2, 4. All right, so everyone see how I got the payoffs? I just used those strategies to tell me which way I'm going through the tree. If I combine them, it gives me an entire path and gets me to an end node. All right, and you can see this redundancy we talked about. We pointed out that these things are kind of the same thing, and you can see in the matrix that the bottom four squares of the matrix have repetition. Right? This row is the same as that row. All right, everyone happy with that? OK, we have a matrix. Let's analyze it by finding the Nash equilibria uh, in this game. All right? So to find the Nash equilibria in this game, we're going to find best responses. All right? So let's start by asking, what is the best response to left? So if player two chooses left, player one's best response is either up, up, or up, down. If player uh, two chooses right, then player one's best response is either down, up, or down, down. All right, everyone okay with so far? All right. If player one chooses up, up, then player two is going to choose left. If player one chooses up, down, then player two's best response is to choose right. If player one chooses down, up, then player two's best response is to choose right. And if player one chooses down, down, then player two's best response is to choose right. All right, so this is kind of slow. And I just want to be, be careful. I'm going slow for a reason. We're, we're going to gradually get harder. I want to be a little bit careful. I can see people looking a little sleepy around the room. I know it's kind of lunchtime. If you see your neighbor getting sleepy, give them a good sharp elbow. Because I think this, is, this, is, this, is, this isn't a good time to fall asleep. In some sense, I'm worried you're going to miss something. And it's then going to get harder and you're going to miss things. All right. So what are the Nash equilibria in this game? We know how to do that. The Nash equilibria must be up, up followed by left, Should I get them all, down, up, followed by right, and down, down, followed by right. All right, I want these three Nash equilibrium. OK, so it wasn't so, such a big deal. I got three equilibrium in this game. And if I'd simply given you this game, in the first half of the semester. I hadn't shown you the tree. You've never seen this tree. I just gave you this game and said, find the Nash equilibrium in this game. And that would have been a, a question on the midterm. We'd have stopped here. Right? We'd have said, OK, I found these Nash equilibria. Maybe you'd have gone on and found mixed ones. I don't know. But essentially, we'd be done at this point. Right? Let's say again. If we'd started as we would have done before the midterm with me giving you a payoff matrix and asking you to find the Nash equilibrium, <coughs> Then at this point, we'd be done. We'd have found the three Nash equilibrium. It's the three pure strategy Nash equilibrium. The problem is, if we go back to the tree, to the dynamic game, the game that has some action going on in it, and actually look at this game, it's not clear that all of these Nash equilibria are really equally plausible. All right? Can anyone see what might be a bit implausible about some of these Nash equilibria? What's, what's implausible about them? Any takers on this? 
Well, let's look at this, this, this game again. Right, this game is a little bit complicated. It's not clear what one should do here, perhaps. And perhaps it's not clear what player two should do here, because after all, player two uh, doesn't know where he is, and he doesn't know whether player one, uh, if player one gets to move again, is going to choose up or down. But, watch the but. Yeah, can we get a mic on, on, uh, on Patrick? Yeah, so if you look at it backwards, you can cross out player one's second choice. He's always going to choose down, so Good. that's one four at that node. Good. So then you know player two is always going to choose right because his payoff is always four. Good. So then player one's not going to have, I mean, player one knows which to choose then. He's going to choose um, down. Good, good. So let's just, let's just walk through what Patrick just said. That's very good. So if we, just, if we just analyze this game the way we've been taught to analyze trees, essentially using backward induction, we first of all observe that, play, that if player one gets to move again here, She'll know where she is, and she'll know she's choosing between 1 and 0. She's going to choose down. Is that right? She's going to choose down. But knowing this, player 2, even though player 2 doesn't know where he is, player 2 actually has a pretty easy choice to make. He knows that if he chooses uh, left, he either gets 2 or 0. But if he chooses right, he gets 4. Right? 4 is bigger than 2, 4 is bigger than 0, so player 2 is actually going to choose right. And given that, given that player 2 is going to choose right, player 1 is essentially choosing between 1, if, if she chooses up, which would be followed by right and down, and 2, which would be what happens if she chooses down, followed by right. So this game we can essentially analyse through backward induction. It's not quite backward induction because we had to add in this little piece about two not knowing where she was, but it turned out no matter where she was, she had a dominant strategy and she had a better strategy once she figures out that player one is going to choose down. Is that right? If we go back and look at these Nash equilibria, the prediction that we just got, which is what? Down for player uh, one, right for player two, and then down again for player one, all right? that strategy is this one. Right? So one of these Nash equilibria corresponds to our sensible analysis of this tree. But the other two do not. These two Nash equilibria are inconsistent with backward induction. Right? They're inconsistent with backward induction. Right? They're perfectly good Nash equilibria. If we'd given you this matrix at the midterm, you'd have thought they're just fine. But it turns out both of these Nash equilibria involve player one choosing a strategy up that we know that player one is not going to do if reached. And one of these Nash equilibria involves player two choosing a strategy uh, left that, in fact, she's only choosing because, player, because she thinks player two uh, player one is going to choose up, which in fact we've just argued player one is not going to do. All right? All right. The people at the back, there's a little bit too much volume bouncing off the wall there, so just keep it, keep it down on the balcony. Thank you. All right? All right? So these two, these two Nash equilibria, they're perfectly good Nash equilibria of the game, but they don't make any sense. All right? They're completely inconsistent with the way we've learned to talk about games. All right? Now, we've seen this before. We saw it in the entry game. This is a much more complicated, much more interesting example, but we saw in the entry game, when there was one entrant entering into a market, that in that game there were actually two Nash equilibria, and one of them, we, we argued, was incredible. Here it's a bit more complicated, but nevertheless, these two equilibria seem like bogus equilibria, or phony equilibria, or equilibria we wouldn't really believe in. And the reason we don't believe in them is that they don't correspond to backward induction and our common sense intuitions about backward induction. All right? So we need some new notion. The aim of the class has been what? We want to be able to model games that have both sequential moves and simultaneous moves. And we want to be able to look at the games and use our techniques from both halves of the class. We want to be able to use the idea of Nash equilibrium from the first half of the class. And we want to be able to use the idea of backward induction from the second half of the class. But what we're learning here is that Nash equilibrium, if we just take the notion of Nash equilibrium and plonk it down on these sequential move games, it will produce equilibria that don't make any sense. 
So we need a more refined notion of equilibrium, a better notion of equilibrium than just Nash equilibrium to deal with these settings where we have both simultaneity and uh, sequential moves. We have both uh, some perfect information and some imperfect information. All right. That was one example. Let me give you a second example if that example wasn't yet convincing. All right, let me leave that example up. So, so far, we've seen that Nash equilibrium gets us into trouble in these games, and we've seen it got us into trouble because it, it basically conflicted with our backward induction intuitions. Now, I'm going to show you a different game, and we're going to see once again Nash equilibrium is going to get us into trouble. All right? This is going to be a three player game. We'll get more complicated as we go along. So, another example, this time with three players. So as the examples get harder, I need you to be more alert to see if you can follow them. All right, so this a more complicated tree. Here's a, a tree in which player one moves first and chooses between A or B. And if player one chooses A, the game is over. She gets one, and the other two players get nothing. If she chooses B, then players two and three get to play a little game down here in which two moves first in this little sub-game and three moves second. And the payoffs in this sub-game are as follows. Again, using player one's payoff first. So there's 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 2, 0, 0, minus 1, and 2, 1, Zero. All right. So this is quite a complicated game. It's got three players for a start, so it's going to be a little bit hard to draw, uh, to draw it up in a matrix. Uh, but nevertheless, let me try and do that. So I claim that we can model this game uh, as, as follows. Uh, it's a game in which player one is choosing which matrix. Let's call this matrix A and matrix B. Player one is choosing the matrix. Player two is choosing, let's call them up and down. Player two is choosing up or down. And player three is choosing left or right. All right. And notice in this game, uh, 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 player. Uh, players two and three actually can observe the choice of A or B to start with. All right. So let's try and put in the payoffs in the correct places. It's not always easy to do, but let's try. So A is easy. If player one chooses A, then the payoffs in this matrix are somewhat trivial. Because if player one chooses A, uh, whatever anyone else does, the payoff is one, zero, zero. All right? So somewhat, somewhat uninteresting matrix over there. But if player one chooses B, then life gets more interesting. Then uh, player, if player two chooses up and player three chooses left, we end up here. So that's 0, 1, 1. If player, one, uh, player two chooses, this is 2 and this is 3. This is 2 and this is 3. If player two chooses up and player three chooses right, then we're at 0, 0, 2. All right, so this is 0, 0, 2 going in here. If player two chooses down and player three chooses left, then we're at 0, 0, minus 1. Everyone okay with that? And if player two chooses down and player uh, sorry, three chooses down, then we're down here, which is 2. <coughs> One, zero. All right. Okay, so here's a little game. Player one is choosing the matrix. Player two is choosing the row in the matrix, albeit trivially on the left hand side. And player three is choosing the column in the matrix, again, albeit trivially on the left hand side. We don't really care about, about 
this picture very much. All right? Okay, so now what? Now what? Well, once again, we could look for Nash equilibria in this game. It turns out there are lots of Nash equilibria in this game. All right, let me just show you one Nash equilibrium, and then we'll talk about it. All right, so I claim, I claim that there are lots of Nash equilibria, and one of them, one of them is the Nash equilibrium A up left. A up left. So let's just see what that is in the tree, first of all. So player one shows A. Player two shows up and left, but it followed A, so we end up here. We end up at 1, 0, 0. All right. All right. So A up left is this box in the tree. All right. Now let's just check that that actually is a Nash equilibrium. All right, so we all know how to do this from the first half of the class. To check that that's a Nash equilibrium, we better check that no individual player can do better by deviating. So let's start with player one. If player one deviates, holding player two and three fixed, then player one will be switching the matrix from matrix A to matrix B. Is that correct? All right, so we'll move from this box in the left-hand matrix to the equivalent box in the right-hand matrix. All right? And player one's payoff will go from one to zero. From one to zero. So player one doesn't want to deviate. Everyone happy with that? Player one doesn't want to deviate here. How about player two? If player two deviates, holding players one and three fixed, then player one is going to switch rows in this matrix. So we'll move from this box to, uh, from, sorry, from this box to this box. Player two was making zero before, She's still making zero, so she has no incentive to deviate. And the same argument applies for player three, because she will be choosing the column holding the row and the matrix fixed. So once again, she gets zero in either case. All right, so everyone happy with that? So that actually is a Nash equilibrium. And again, if this had been the midterm, I could have set this up. I could have given you these matrices uh, or the story behind them, and you'd have found this. You could have, I could have asked you whether this was a Nash equilibrium, and the answer would have been yes. But I claim that, once again, this is just not a believable Nash equilibrium. It is a Nash equilibrium. Formally, it's a Nash equilibrium. But it's not a plausible prediction for how this game's going to be played. Why is it not a plausible prediction for how this game's going to be played? Anyone see? Stare at the tree a bit. Right? So in, in the information here, in the pre-midterm information, it's fine. But knowing about the actual structure of this game... I claim this makes no sense at all. Why does it make no sense? Well, notice that if player one were to switch her action from the prescribed action A to action B, then we'd be here. All right? And notice that the tree from here on in looks like a little game. Is that right? The tree from here on looks like a little game. All right, so this thing here, let's put it in green, this thing here is a little game within the game. It's a sub-game. Right? And this sub-game really only involves two players. The two players that it involves are players two and player three. Player one's done. Player one's put us into this game. But now in this little sub-game, it's a little sub-game involving just player two and player three. So we can analyze this little sub-game. If we analyze this little subgame, what will it give us? What will we find? All right? So let's look at this subgame. So look at the green the green subgame. The game that would have happened had player 1 chosen B. This is a subgame involving just players 2 and 3, so why don't I just forget player 1? All right? We know what I mean, player 1 is part of the game, he's getting payoffs. But player one has made their move. They're not really involved anymore. So let's just look at this game as a game involving players two and three. And let's look at the matrix for players two and three. So this is this. Actually, it corresponds to the matrix above. It's a, it's a matrix in which player two is choosing up and down. Here it is, up and down. And simultaneously, player three is choosing left or right. 
here it is, left or right, that this information says. And the payoffs are 1, 1, 0, 2, 0, minus 1, and 1, 0. All right. All right. So this is, I claim, a representation of this little green game. Perhaps we should put this in green as well. All right, this thing corresponds to that thing. All right, everyone okay with that? All right, so if player one had chosen, to cho had chosen B rather than A, then we'd be involved in a little game, a game within a game, or a sub-game involving just players two or three, and we can analyze that game. That's a, that's a straightforward game. Here it is. And what would we do with that game? We'd look for the Nash equilibrium in that game. So let's look for the Nash equilibrium in this game. So what do we notice about this game? So if player three chooses left, then player uh, two would rather choose up. If player three chooses uh, right, then player two should choose down. If player two chooses up, then player three would rather choose right, because two is bigger than one. And if player two were to choose down, then player three would choose right again, because zero is bigger than minus one. All right. So in fact, in this little sub-game, in this little sub-game, actually, player three has a dominant strategy. Right? If it turned out that we got involved in this little sub-game, player three has a dominant strategy, which is to play right. And moreover, this sub-game has just one Nash equilibrium. If I'd given you this sub-game on its own, it's clear that the Nash equilibrium of this sub-game, or this game within a game, is down right. It's down right. So what's that telling us? It's telling us if player two and three ever get called upon to play in this game, and that only happens when a, player one chooses B, if player two and three ever get called upon to play in this game, we know from when we were young, or at least from before the midterm, we know that they're going to play Nash equilibrium in that sub-game, and the Nash equilibrium in the sub-game is going to have player three choosing right and player two choosing down. All right? But the equilibrium we talked about, this equilibrium we, we argued before about, AUL, was, doesn't, uh, the equilibrium we talked about before, AUL, doesn't involve player two choosing down. In fact, she chose up. And it doesn't involve player three choosing right. In fact, she chose left. All right? So let's sum up. This, we found an equilibrium of this game. This equilibrium of this game was A U L. But I claim this is not a plausible equilibrium. It's not a plausible equilibrium because it predicts that if we actually were to play the game within the game, we wouldn't play equilibrium. Let me say it again. In the whole game, in the whole game, A up left is an equilibrium. But I claim it's a silly equilibrium because it involves the prediction that if, in fact, we ever got into the game within the game, we would no longer play equilibrium. And that doesn't seem right. If we're going to believe in equilibrium, we should be consistent and believe in equilibrium throughout. All right. So this brings us to a new idea. Right. And the new idea is going to have two parts to it. The first part is kind of on the board already. It's Something we talked about informally, it's the notion of a sub-game. It's the notion of a sub-game. Right? What's a sub-game? It's a game within a game. All right? I've been using that informally, but we need to start thinking about more formally what it means. All right? So I talked about it informally. I said that green object is the game that would be played were player one to choose B. And we've talked about other sub-games in this class. We talked about the sub-game that would happen in the entry game 
if one of those, if one of those uh, uh, rival, baking, uh, uh, rival pizza companies uh, moved in in uh, the Miami market or something. It was a game within a game. When we talked about the Tour de France, we talked about there being a game within a game that is about when you break away. But now I want to be formal about this notion of a game within a game and introduce some nomenclature. So the formal definition is this. Definition. A sub-game... A sub-game is a part of a game informally that looks like a game within the tree. And it has three properties. It satisfies the following three properties. So one, since it looks like a game itself, the sub-game must start from a particular point. Right? So it starts, the sub-game must start, it starts from a single node. And let's just look at the example. In the example we just looked at, the sub-game started from this node here. Second, second, it comprises, it comprises all successors, successors to that node. So in our example, Here's our subgame. Here's our green subgame. Here's the node it starts from. Here are all the nodes that are successors of that node. These are the children, and these are the grandchildren. Right? If you have this grandparent node, you have to have all of his children and all of his grandchildren. All right? So it comprises all the successors of that node. And finally, and this is important, it does not it does not break up it does not break up any information sets it does not break up any information sets so a sub game informally it's just a little game within the game but slightly more formally I can't put one node that's part of an information set into this subgame unless I'm going to put all the nodes that are part of that information set into the subgame. All right? Let's have a look at some examples. We've got one example up there. The entry game looks something like this. Right? The entry game looks something like this. So what are the subgames here? So no secrets here. This is a subgame. Right? There's actually another subgame. Can you want to see what the other subgame is? The whole game is a subgame. All right? The whole game is itself a subgame. Somewhat trivially. All right? So this is this this particular game, which is the which is the schematic of the entry game, it has actually two subgames, but only one proper subgame. Here's a more complicated example. Right, this is actually going to be quite a complicated example, just to make life interesting. So one is going to move, then two is going to move, and then one is going to move again. This is all one big information set for player one. And one is going to move like this. So again, without payoffs, this is a little tree, and the key point here is this is an information set. All right, let's, look, let's stare at this tree a second and figure out what are and are not subgames. So first of all, what, so this, this was a subgame and this was a subgame. What about this thing here? Is that a subgame? It's not a sub, what, 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 what rule does it break? It's, it's breaking up an information set, right? It's breaking up an information set. So that's no good because of rule three. What about... Uh, this thing. 
That doesn't break up an information set. I've got the whole information set in there. Is that any good? No, that's no good because it doesn't start from a singleton node. That's no good. It violates one. And uh, if we do this, if we look at this piece, that piece there, that's also no good. Why is that no good? It, again, it breaks up an information set. All right, so this is no good again because of rule three. All right, so you, you, can, you can practice at home drawing trees and trying to identify what are and what are not subgames. All right, so with the, with the definition of a subgame now formal, right, it's basically just formalizing something we've talked about before, which is the idea of a game within the game, I want to introduce our new, what's going to be our new solution concepts. And this is going to be the solution concept we're going to use essentially uh, almost until the final. Definition. So just remember what our task is. Our task is to come up with a solution concept that picks up the idea from the first half of the semester, namely Nash equilibrium, but does so in a way that respects what we've learned in the second half of the semester, namely that games have sequential elements and people move by backward induction. So in particular, what we want to rule out are those Nash equilibria that instruct players down the tree to play in subgames according to strategies that are not Nash equilibria. Say it again. We want to rule out those Nash equilibria that instruct people way down the tree to play according to something which is not a Nash equilibrium. We want our new notion to say, wherever you find yourself in a tree, play Nash equilibrium. And that's exactly what the definition is going to say. So a Nash equilibrium, NE, S1 star, S2 star, all the way up to Sn star, is a sub-game perfect, sub-game perfect equilibrium. It's a sub-game perfect equilibrium, so that's an SPE. It's a sub-game perfect equilibrium. if it induces a Nash equilibrium in every subgame of the game. All right, so a subgame perfect equilibrium, it has to itself be a Nash equilibrium, of course, but it also has to instruct players to play a Nash equilibrium in every subgame. Let's take that immediately back to our examples. In this example, in this example, we know, let's bring it down, in this example, we know that this is a subgame. We know that in this subgame, there is only one Nash equilibrium, and that Nash equilibrium involves player two choosing down and player three choosing right. All right? So we know we know that player 2 is going to choose down according to that equilibrium and player 3 is going to choose right according to that equilibrium. So if we now have to look for an equilibrium of the whole game, let's go back to player 1's choice. Player 1 if they choose A will get 1. If they chose B, then they know that this Nash equilibrium will be played, so they'll get 2. They prefer 2 to 1, so the subgame perfect equilibrium here is player 1 chooses B, player 2 chooses down, and player 3 chooses right. This is an equilibrium of the game, and it, in, it, in, it induces, here it is, it induces an equilibrium in the subgame. All right, so in that example, the subgame perfect equilibrium is found by first of all looking in the subgame, find the equilibrium in the subgame, and then go back and look at the equilibrium in the whole game. The equilibrium we end up with, it is a Nash equilibrium in the whole game, but more importantly, it induces a Nash equilibrium in the subgame. Let's just go back to our other example, and then I'll stop. So our other example was here. 
Here was our other example. And we claimed, hang on everybody, we claimed that the good equilibrium here, the one we believed in, was down, down, right. All right? Where are the subgames in this game? Where are the subgames in this tree? Anybody? So I claim there's only one real subgame here, and that's this piece. All right? This is a subgame. All right? What's the Nash equilibrium of this somewhat trivial subgame? The Nash equilibrium of this somewhat trivial subgame is that player one must choose down. So for a Nash equilibrium to be a subgame perfect equilibrium, here are our three Nash equilibria, one, two, three. For this Nash equilibrium to be a subgame perfect equilibrium, it's got to instruct player one to choose down in the trivial subgame. And here it is. This is our subgame perfect equilibrium in this game. Now, I know today was a lot of formal stuff, a lot of new ideas. When we come back on Monday, we'll first of all give you a game that refreshes these ideas, and then we'll go straight to applications. So trust me, there will be applications. It will be useful. See you on Monday. There's a homework to come in, and there's another one on the web going out.